Once upon a time, a guy named Phil had a son called Alex, and this Alex guy beat some Persian or other at a place called Gorgamila. Technically, the Battle of Gorgamila was one of the most important battles in human history, but everybody knows about Gorgamila, and here at Robert Explains, we prefer our history more obscure. It is Alex I'd like to start talking about, though, or Alexander the Great, King of Macedon, to give the man his proper name and title. Post Gorgamila, he briefly settled in the city of Babylon before marching further east to the very ends of the known world, settling or resettling 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 cities along the way, because he was quite fond of founding cities. He also fought a battle on the river Hydaspes, after which his troops had quite enough of heading east, and so he took them back to Babylon, where he died. If you like this video, feel free to oh, we're not finished yet. If anything, our story is only just beginning. In the western parts of his empire, Alexander's successors fought war after war after war against each other, but in the east, the ordinary Greek soldiers who'd been settled in Alexander's city started asserting their cultural sovereignty, creating the odd situation in which Greece proper was still culturally Greek, Egypt and Syria created a unique fusion culture of Greek and native origins, Mesopotamia and Persia largely retained their native culture, but Bactria and Sogdiana, in the very far east of the empire, were as Greek as Thessaly or Rhodes. As I mentioned, the successors of Alexander fought each other in the west, and the Seleucid dynasty that was nominally in control of the biggest chunk of Alexander's empire absolutely ignored most of it, focusing only on their Syrian heartland. This gave some of the Greeks in the east ideas, and a certain Diodotos, who had been the satrap of Bactria under Seleucid rule, declared his satrapy independent, creating the Greco-Bactrian kingdom. At roughly the same time, the satrapy of Parthia was invaded by a tribe from the steppe known as the Parni. Parni took over the Parthian positions of power and ended Parthia's suzerainty to the Seleucids. They were rather successful at this because the Seleucids were fighting against the Ptolemies, again, at the time and in no position to resist. The Bactrians and Parthians allied with each other and beat King Seleucus II in battle once he'd returned from his Egyptian war, which had been a complete disaster for the Seleucids, by the way. Once more the Seleucids would try to regain the east when King Antiochus III invaded in 209 BC. Antiochus actually defeated the Bactrians in battle but couldn't win the subsequent siege of Bactra, ultimately giving up and recognising Bactrian independence. If you're vaguely knowledgeable about geography, it's probably not escaped your attention that this whole tale has taken place on the periphery of two of the ancient world's greatest cultural centres, India and China. Well, that didn't escape the attention of the Bactrian Greeks either, and so when they expanded their influence to Alexandria Escarte in the Fergana Valley, as well as the rest of Sogdiana, they sent expeditions east from there, well into China. Relations between the Greeks and the Chinese seem to have been rather friendly, and they established embassies in each other's cities. This cultural and economic exchange between Han Dynasty China and the Hellenic world led very directly to the establishment of the Silk Road, thus creating the first real link between China and Europe in history. India was a different matter altogether. At this time, the Mauryan Empire was nominally in charge of most of India, but the area directly adjacent to Bactria, now known as the Punjab, was often plagued with instability and lack of Mauryan control. The Greeks and Mauryans were technically friends, but when the Shunga overthrew the Mauryans, the Greco-Bactrians invaded India and took control of the Hindu Kush and the Punjab. We've now arrived in the late 2nd century BC, and before I talk more about what happened in India, I need to just mention a few major things that happened further west. First of all, Rome. At the start of our story, Rome was a tiny city-state, freshly sacked by Gauls, but by this point it was a colossal empire that had subsumed the independent Greek city-states, Macedon, and all the Greek states in Anatolia. It had also turned Ptolemaic Egypt into a de facto vassal, leaving just the Seleucids as a Greek power in the Mediterranean. Except they weren't. The Seleucids still existed in the Mediterranean, but they were no longer a power to be reckoned with, all because of her old friends Parthia. The Parthians had been rather successful in their wars against the Seleucids, conquering the eastern satrapies, Persia proper, and even Mesopotamia, leaving the Seleucids in control of nothing much more than Syria. Another century later, when Rome was experiencing the time of his most famous generals and transformed from a republic into an empire, this all came to an end. Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus conquered the rump state of the Seleucids and Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus, better known as Emperor Augustus, incorporated Egypt into his empire after defeating Marcus Antonius and Cleopatra. Ptolemaic Egypt is commonly regarded as the last classical Greek state in the world, but we know that isn't so because of the Greco-Bactrians. Yeah, some bad news about them, I'm afraid. Remember how way back in the story the satrapy of Parthia fell to the Parni tribe from the steppe? Well, Bactria suffered the same fate, except for them it was the UAG who invaded and ended the history of the Greeks in the east, or rather, the history of the Greeks in Bactria. 
the Hindu Kush was still a formidable barrier, and the Uaji didn't have much success in crossing it, so the Greco-Bactrian kingdom in India would remain in existence, now known as the Indo-Greek kingdom. Far from lingering on for just a few years, the Indo-Greek kingdom actually prospered and created a unique blend of Greek and Buddhist Indian culture that would have an influence in India for centuries to come. The end of the Indo-Greeks is actually shrouded in quite a lot of mystery. We know the independence of their kingdom ended in the year 10, when the Indo-Scythians conquered them, but individual Indo-Greek city-states are thought to have existed for decades longer, if not centuries. Anyway, now you know that if people ask you, and I'm sure they will, who the last great classical Greek ruler was, you now know it wasn't Cleopatra of Egypt, but Strato III Philopator of Greek India. If you like this video, feel free to subscribe to Robert Explains, and if you hated it, feel equally free to spew vitriol at your leisure. Until next time.